David Fuller, welcome to the Unspeakable Podcast. Good to see you, Megan. It's great to see you. As my listeners know, I don't normally record on video, but we're doing this as a video interview because your uh, whole imprimatur, Rebel Wisdom, is very video oriented. And I know you you and I have spoken um, on your podcast. So I thought we would just kind of pick up from maybe where we were talking uh, whenever we last spoke. And I know we've had a couple of conversations in the interim, many of them having to do with kind of the state of the heterodoxy. I don't know how else to put it. I know that's something you've been um, following a lot and you have a lot of thoughts about sort of where the uh, the so-called IDW is in this moment. But um, maybe we could just start by you talking about what you've been thinking about lately in terms of all of this. Yeah. So that's kind of been my obsession, I guess, as someone who came from mainstream or legacy media into alternative media in about 2018 with coinciding with the kind of rise of Jordan Peterson and then the birth of the intellectual dark web, which I know you marked as well with your kind of famous essay right and feeling like coming from a very narrow conversation and feeling sort of very aligned with i think what barry weiss first said in her new york times article that it it would be great to crack open the doors of conversation a little bit more and that sense of particularly in 2018 that there was a a kind of insurgency against a kind of naive liberal worldview that was kind of all pervasive in the media and that these there were lots of topics that couldn't really be reasonably talked about and that was a necessary thing and uh, a friend of mine summarized that as saying jordan peterson broke a conversational seal and so feeling that kind of quite keenly and then yeah showcasing a lot of those voices interviewing a lot of those people and then feeling more and more like I feel like very keenly like we're not in 2018 anymore (laughs) is that a good thing or a bad thing do you want to click your heels and go back or are you uh, is it uh, goodbye to all that I mean what I what I mean by that is that I feel we've had the we've had the kind of response and while it's true that there are there is still a lot of kind of um naive um, ideological capture in a lot of the institutions, there is also a very strong counterpoint to that. And I feel like what we need now is more of a synthesis, not a kind of insurgency, but a more of a synthesis. There needs to be a heterodoxy that has more nuance and more, and is oriented towards, because I also think that whole IDW, or IDW movement got captured itself. It became kind of quite reactionary. A lot of the key figures in it became quite either reactionary or conspiratorial or captured by their audience. And the sort of the the big picture is if the IDW, as it was first framed as a kind of alternative sense making enterprise, and I I fully believed in that at the time, I was really reassured to see that there was sort of something of a bottom up response from the internet. Um, to the failures of the mainstream media, but what we've seen, like the morality tale of the IDW, has been the failure conditions of the alternative media, which is mainly the failure conditions of what happens when we become our brands. And we get captured by our audience, we get captured by the incentive structures. And that for me is like the big, in a way, still untold story of the last four or five years is the is the morality tale of the IDW. And we can kind of point to individual cases, but I think we can all, most of us who've been paying attention to the space can can see that that was one of, one of the things that was not appreciated. We all, like I put out an interview with Eric Weinstein where he talked about the, the incentive structures within the mainstream and how they warp truth-seeking. But what we found is that there are incentive structures outside the mainstream that warp truth-seeking just as, just as completely. And in a way, all of the, this is why I talk about the crisis of sense making a lot and the way that we're impacted by all the different kind of ways that we inter- we encounter the world through filter bubbles and incentive structures and the race to the bottom of the brainstem. What I think 
has become increasingly clear is that all of those factors that are operating all of us individually are magnified on creators, especially if you then, your entire livelihood and your entire living is based on feeding that beast. And I think we've seen an awful lot of people get lost in that kind of incentive overload of information that's been coming back. So yeah, that's the, that's the big picture. And then right now, I'm fascinated by the Russia situation and how that is providing yet another moment of clarity, a moment of moral clarity in many ways, I would say. And also, it's it really, more than anything else that's happened, shows that the idea that we can set the world to rights through long form podcasting is just ludicrous. <laughs> like it just demonstrates, it demonstrates we need the institutions desperately. We need, we need functioning structures and we need functioning media. We need all of these things. And it's like, and for me, that's a kind of, it's a little bit of a relief in a way. Like, to be honest, the, the Russia thing has been a bit of a relief because I've seen a lot of people humiliate themselves who needed to be humiliated with their kind of hot takes on blaming it on single factors like, oh, it's because of wokeness oh or oh, it's because yeah. of this or because of that. And it's like, that's insane. And I think it's also a kind of wake up call for what really needs to happen, which is, I think, some rebooting of the institutions and um, the necessity of the institutions. Yeah, the wokeness take, that doesn't, I, I've, I'm surprised to see um, otherwise intelligent people really uh, doubling down on that. It's, can you explain where you think that's coming from? Is it just reflexive at this point to want to blame everything on wokeness because it sort of feels good viscerally? I think there are different layers to it. I think if you're going to make the argument that the West has lost faith in itself and, and wokeness is a factor of that, I think there's some truth there to say that there is this very influential viewpoint in the West that basically sees the West as a kind of, the West values as essentially a cloak for nothing but power and that effectively we're just the same as Putin. And obviously that view is being pushed and amplified by the Russians themselves as much as possible. Um, then you can understand, okay, there is, there is this powerful, powerful worldview that is sort of um, attacking the West from within. I think there's some truth to that. But if you're going to blame, you're going to reduce down like geopolitical history and Russia's imperial ambitions and Putin's kind of increasing isolation and all of these different factors that have led to where we're at now to, oh, it's because the military is now insisting you put your pronouns in your bio or something like that. It's just, it's ludicrous. It's, it's completely insane to, to reduce it down to that. But at the same time, I do think that there is some truth to the idea that there are enemies within, but I think there are enemies within in, on all sides. There's the, there's the kind of QAnon phenomenon on the right that kind of is, is very pro-Putin and is, is equally, and what I say about the wokeness thing is it's not it's not wokeness as much as it's, it's the split over topics like wokeness. It's actually the culture war itself that is, that is the weakening thing, not necessarily one side or the other. It's the fact that these things have become incredibly divisive and are, are tearing our societies apart. So in a way, it's, it's one side of the picture, but the, the whole picture is that it's, it's, it's the culture war over these topics that is the, the fundamental or one of the fundamental things I think that Putin is looking at and saying that this is weakening the West. Mm -hmm. Well, let's just back up a little bit in case in case there's anyone in my audience who's not totally familiar with you. You come from legacy media. Or haven't heard about the war in Ukraine yet. Yeah, well, who knows when this is going to air. So it might be over by the time I, I post this in, in a week. But okay, so you came from legacy media. You are like a Gen X guy. You... You did not grow up in the world of podcasts and YouTube. Um, what was what was it like for you to be working in mainstream media when you did, and when did you sort of start to become frustrated with it? So I trained as a journalist in about 2002. I started working at the BBC originally as an online journalist, 
when that was sort of first, when that pretty much first started, and then transferred over, trained in TV in 2005. And I worked as a foreign producer for many years at Channel 4 News, covering things like the Arab Spring and kind of uh, geopolitics. And then in 2012, I left. I actually did a couple of documentaries about Russia after I left Channel 4 News. So I was doing mostly documentaries from about 2012 onwards. But I had a lot of experience within the newsroom at the BBC and Channel 4 News, which I think is a fairly, it's an interesting place to be because you then, you do start to really see like what the contours of the conversation are in a very sort of up close and personal way. And my, my sense of where the conversation was very narrow was actually related to um, probably more spirituality than anything else was the sense that most of our metrics and most of the way we understand the world is very materialist, it's very rationalist, it's very, I was very aware of how the conversation was kind of shaped by the sort of new atheist worldview and felt, and I was doing a lot of meditation practice, I was doing a lot of kind of transformational work and feeling like there was a more um, interesting story that wasn't being told about deeper purpose and why we were here, like the, the bigger, bigger questions of life, like why we were here, uh, what are we capable of? And just feeling like the, the news agenda was so, so narrowly focused on a very small number of metrics like GDP, for example, rather than what, is a, what, is, what makes a life worth living. Um, and so that was my initial feeling of, of where I felt my level of frustration. And it wasn't really until and so that was what I really wanted to be doing when I when I left was making more films about that. And that's why I was so drawn by Jordan Peterson when I first heard him in 2017. And wow, this kind of like deep mythological perspective that just felt really, really resonant. And I still would urge anyone who has a kind of opinion about Jordan Peterson to go back to his initial lecture series, The Maps of Meaning from 2017, because this is a, a really fascinating, very complex kind of theory of everything that I, I still think is brilliant, very, and, and yeah, really fascinating. And so from there, Jordan Peterson, I then went on to other thinkers like Ken Wilber and other kind of philosophers. And really since then, Rebel Wisdom has been about trying to look at cultural topics and explain cultural topics through the deeper philosophical, psychological lenses, very much feeling like we're in a time where those lenses are now increasingly relevant. We've all got a sense that some of the frameworks that, that, we've been, that have been kind of ruling our lives are breaking down, like this very technocratic rationalist um, way of understanding the world is sort of increasingly breaking down. And one of the themes that we talk about is the kind of return of, we're in, I sort of see it as we're in a post-secular age. So we're seeing all of these manifestations of kind of religious phenomenon coming out after the end of a sort of, the, the death of the kind of technocratic worldview that was symbolized by an unglobalist worldview as well that was symbolized by Trump and by Brexit. And I think now what we're seeing is a lot of these kind of religious impulses making themselves known through politics in terms of woke and MAGA or QAnon. And th this is, yeah, that, that's, those are the most interesting lenses that I find to kind of try and understand what's happening at the moment. And I've yeah, I, I find it so much more fascinating to look at things through a kind of religious lens or a philosophical or psychological lens, because those, yeah, I just think those are far more interesting conversations to be had. Oh, I didn't realize that you, that this had started with Jordan Peterson for you. And he's such a, he's the classic example of, of audience capture. I mean, do you want to talk a little bit about just your, your journey in terms of your relationship to him and his work and his persona? Have, have you interviewed him? What's your relationship to him personally? Yeah, so I interviewed him in 
2017, and that was the first piece that was put out on Rebel Wisdom. I did a, I interviewed him on 2017. I then put out a documentary about him that was um, the first film that came out. But then he had that famous meeting with Kathy Newman. That, and I'd been working with Kathy Newman only a week or two before in the Channel 4 News office. So I was like struck by this incredible synchronicity because I'd just done the first documentary about Jordan Peterson. I used to work at Channel 4 News. And a lot of what I've been talking to Jordan Peterson about was synchronicity. So I was kind of struck by this kind of obvious synchronicity. And then I put together a film called A Glitch in the Matrix about the whole, the layers of what was going on during his conversation with Kathy Newman and then what it reflected about the media, what it reflected about gender politics, what it reflected about a moment in time in the sort of post-Trump era. And that was the thing that went really viral and pretty much gave birth to Rebel Wisdom. Okay. So he put that on his channel as well. And, and I maintained a kind of back and forth with him for a while and then at some point lost that connection. I think it was about the same time that I did a quite challenging interview with Dave Rubin, where I kind of took him to task and what I felt was a very partisan way that he was doing things. And I mean, I mean, everyone knows the story of Dave Rubin by now, pretty much. But this was about 2018, I think, when I did the interview with Rubin. And he was very unhappy about it. And I think that was what ended my relationship with Jordan Peterson. Since then, I look back and I, I do think the initial hopes that I had, a lot of what he was saying then, he was a sort of slightly more muscular version of Jonathan Haidt. If you look at what he was saying back, back then, he was saying we need the left and we need the right. And more and more, he, he became, instead of kind of holding up what I would call more of a synthesis position beyond the culture war, he became a culture warrior himself. Right. And, and took sides. I mean, I guess he took sides fairly early on, but, but increasingly just became more and more, yeah, as you said, audience captured, I, I guess, is a, is a good summary. I mean, because of course, I, I remember the video that you, that you did. That was, that's an incredible film. And, you know, just so our audience knows, the Kathy Newman interview was the one where she was talking with him and she kind of reduced the whole thing down to the, to the pronoun dispute. Was that right? So he kind of, was that in the fall of 2016 that he, that, that kind of broke no, the C16, was, uh, the, uh, when was that? Yeah. The C16 thing was, was 2016. Right. The Channel 4 News interview was January, 2018. Oh, okay. So what was she, what was their little argument where, cause he was saying, uh, you know, he was trying to make some complicated points and she kept saying, well, well, what you're saying is, and then she would reduce it to like nothingness. And this became a meme literally. So what was the actual, um, kind of point of contention in that interview? Just to uh, remind our listeners, do you remember? It was mostly about, yeah, it was mostly about, um, gender. Right. And she was she was trying to frame him as he was trying to make the argument that there were differences between men and women. And she was trying to frame him as saying that there should be differences between <laughs> men and women and that he would impose those as a member of the patriarchy. Even though he was able to say, look, I've, I've worked, I'm a clinical psychologist. I've worked with women right. over many years to try and increase their um disagreeability and to to encourage them to go for raises and there's lots of these right. other reasons why women are paid less than men or um and and yeah she kept trying to frame him as as a kind of retrograde misogynist which clearly didn't work and she and she kind of but it was also it was also a case of she was playing a very old media role of trying to catch him out she was a Kathy Newman used to be a political correspondent. I don't know if anyone, may, your American listeners probably wouldn't know that, but Kathy was a, a very good political correspondent. And political journalism in the UK is really all about, like, how do you catch the person out? How do you get them? It's a very gladiatorial form of 
It's the gotcha so journalism. Yeah. As we call it. Very here. much yeah. so. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. And so she came from that origin. And she also came from that origin where the Houses of Parliament, political journalism is probably one of the last bastions of, of quite really misogynistic um, what kind of interaction. So I think she's she was sort of quite alert for that and and over kind of expected that that's who she was going to deal with. So I'm curious if you have thoughts about what what brings your audience to Rebel Wisdom? Because we know there's a sort of common narrative about what what Jordan Peterson's audience found attractive about him. I mean, we know it was a lot of young men. Obviously, these are huge generalizations. There's a lot of women who are interested in him, myself included. I'm not a I'm not a fan girl, but um, I think he has a lot of valuable things to offer. Um, but this is what we know, you know, disaffected young men, they're looking for a father figure. They, they, they don't feel that they have any structure or discipline in their lives on the most fundamental level. Okay. So we know that about him. You build rebel wisdom out of, um, you know, covering Jordan Peterson and sort of thinking out loud about him. What kinds of people started coming to you and what were they telling you was missing from their own lives? Yeah, it's interesting because I would say that we so we have a membership model where people pay a certain amount and come to our regular events. And they I don't know if so many of them were Jordan Peterson. A lot of them obviously found us through Jordan Peterson, but it's it's much more gender mixed. There's there's probably Closer to 50 50, I would say, maybe 60 40 men to women in our membership. And we've got a lot more people who come from the integral background. So, Ken Wilber's philosophy of the kind of late 90s, early 2000s, he was trying to sort of synthesize all of the world's knowledge, including spirituality, into one system. And then a lot of people were attracted to that. And so we, I would say that the kind of integral refugees is how we kind of see them are make up quite a large proportion of our, of our membership and not so many of the Jordan Peterson fans, I would say. Um, we don't have so many of them. It's more, and certainly since, since the Jordan Peterson days, which really kind of peaked, I guess, in 2018, most of the people that we have now are attracted to the personal growth stuff that we do. We do kind of one or two uh, sessions a month based on different personal growth practices. Um, we do a sense making course, which is based around making sense of the world, but also making sense of ourselves. So using practices from meditation and breath work and stuff like that to so we we bias probably more towards the kind of personal growth kind of ecosystem than than the Jordan Peterson one I would say but but there's still an overlap with with people who are interested in deep kind of religious or mythological frames as well and how many of them are actually coming and saying I am fed up with wokeness and this feels like an antidote is it that literal I think a lot of people are pleased to find others who feel shut down in their own lives and are glad to find others who that they can express themselves with but it's not it's not a dominant perspective i wouldn't say um and i'm glad of that because i think that's one of the dangers and i think we had that a little bit more at the beginning where there was a, a lot more kind of quite hardcore um anti-woke people and i feel like someone like dave rubin probably especially once you build your sort of Patreon off the back of people like that, you, you get yourself into trouble. And I feel quite glad we managed to avoid that because we, we moved away from just that kind of content yeah. quite early. Yeah, I mean, because I'm having an interesting thing happen where, so like I teach writing workshops, right? And so I'm having more and more people come to the writing workshop, not necessarily because they want to write, but because they want to kind of have a place to talk about heterodox ideas and it's not they're not like 
super anti-wokeness people, but they want those kinds of nuanced conversations. But I have noticed, I think, and this is why I wanted to talk with you now in particular, that I, even in the last six months, it's like the, a lot of the, you know, the, the, the Dave Rubens of the world, that's, I think he's jumped the shark, but you know, the constant, like the, you know, banging away at culture war issues, you know, day after day after day, I think that's wearing thin on people, but they really don't know where to go. It's hard to kind of find a third way. You know, it's like, how do you get past, how, how do you talk about the, th- instead of talking about what you can't talk about, how do you just talk about, talk about the things and what are the things? And, and then how much do you obsess about those particular things? It's like, do we talk, I want to talk about gender in a way that, is is productive and useful because I do think it's urgent that we have certain kinds of conversations about what's going on with gender ideology and the medical establishment and all that. I don't see that as a culture war issue necessarily, but I guess my question for you is how do you guide people um, with respect to isolating exactly what needs to be talked about and kind of getting rid of the the hysteria and just kind of anger at other people's inabilities to talk about it. Yeah, there's, so we have, for example, we're, we're just about to launch a course called the art of difficult conversation, where we've got a facilitator who's trained in authentic relating and various other kind of modalities of um, communication styles. And so that's, that's very much core is like, how do you give people those tools and those skills? The other thing I'd say is that it's interesting looking from the UK at the US, because I think there are differences between the UK and the US. I have this vague hope that it might be possible, given that we share a common language, that we might be able to help by resolving some of the, some of the issues that are, that are kind of completely pulling your society apart. Like you, do, you guys don't seem to be able to talk to each other in any meaningful way. And you've got this huge <laughs> split between the kind of the media classes where there seems to be a, a much more effective firewall around certain topics in the US, like the trans conversation, for example, where certain views will put you beyond the pale in polite society. There's a more healthy conversation going on in the UK now. There's been a, a really of- you have J.K. Rowling. How can you say that? I feel like you guys started the uh, the impossibility of talking about gender. Well, that's what I mean. Is like J.K. Rowling is a classic example of a kind of old school feminist Labour Party stalwart who who questions the gender ID thing, and she's like she's she's obviously taken a lot of uh, stick for it, but I think has has successfully put has put the the conversation on the map. We've had a series of fascinating developments over here, like with Stonewall, uh, the the Stonewall podcast created by the BBC of all right. of all things. Right. The BBC created a podcast about the influence of Stonewall's gender um, gender ideology on the BBC asking whether the BBC could remain neutral if it was being signed up to the Stonewall's gender diversity scheme. Uh, I think it was the diversity champion scheme. Mm -hmm. But that's that's extraordinary. And it also shows, like, I think there are a few reasons why we have a slightly healthier conversation. But that, that, it doesn't mean that the conversation is any less fraught. And I think it is just as heated over here. But I, I don't think that the the battle lines have been drawn in quite the same way. And so there is a healthier conversation because I think a lot of a lot of old school feminists who are influential within the Labour Party and within kind of um, British culture are questioning this dogma. Mm-hmm. And it and I, also I, I look at even the COVID conversation. We kind of did the right thing at the right times most of the time in the UK. We never really masked children. We never insisted on mandates. We never insisted on pa- vaccine passports. We never divided society based on your vaccination status. We kind of muddled through in a fairly kind of smart way. And it just seems that the reason we were able to do that is that the conversations didn't break down quite as much as they did elsewhere in the world 
You look at Canada as a perfect example of what happens where the conversation completely breaks down and you you get this kind of um, group think around the, the government and Trudeau and people who then basically create a polarization with others who disagree. And then you get this kind of crazy face off between the two where you think, how on earth have they got themselves into this position? So, yeah, that's a, a broader way around of saying, I think and hope that we might have the talent for synthesis of some of these conversations where you can have a nuanced conversation that holds certain things in balance that it seems that you guys in the US are not capable of doing. Yeah, what's, uh, what's your secret? What are we doing wrong that you're doing right? I think it's a series of factors linked to the fact that it's a longer, longer evolving society. I think it's, it's a healthier media ecosystem because the BBC acts as this kind of central unifying force that is not commercial. It still has its biases, it still has its problems, but it's not, it's not invested in clickbait in the same way. After Brexit, the, U, the BBC was forced to say, we need to represent people better than we did. We're, we're paid for by everyone in the country. So that's one. There's a much more centralized media ecosystem that I think is, means that people are talking to each other more. It's centralized on London. Um, and I think we're just a little bit more, we've got a little bit more detachment from things. Just the British character is a little bit more detached that we're able to, taking yourself seriously is a, is a real crime in, <laughs> in Britain. And I have to say, you Americans don't, don't have that same immune system activated in the same way. Which also comes back to the IDW because I was gonna say that you know nobody takes themselves more seriously than take, the IDW. Jesus Christ, <laughs> do these people take themselves seriously? Uh, you do have a few IDW figures over there. I mean, Douglas Murray takes himself pretty seriously. Let's uh, let's be fair. Um, oh, he does, but he also he's also able to do self deprecation well, in a way in a, that I can't very, imagine some of these other people. Do. British way, yeah. So that I was this was yeah. going to lead me to my next question. So the IDW, the intellectual dark web. If anybody doesn't know, I mean that I think that that term is um, so cringe worthy as to be pretty clearly on its way out now. But um, do you think that that is a phenomenon that could only have arisen in the U.S.? Jordan Peterson is a Canadian. That's but he does take himself yes. seriously. Yes. That's true. Yes, I do. I think, could it only have existed in the US? I mean, it was naming mostly US people, but not only because Douglas Murray was also included in it as well. Jordan Peterson was included in it. I think, yes, because in some ways it's in opposition to the American media ecosystem. Right. And it certainly was naming, I share your concerns or your kind of um, raised eyebrow at the name, but it certainly named something as a, whatever that thing was. And I think it was an emergent phenomenon that in some ways was kind of captured by the idea of the IDW. And in a way, the big tragedy for me was that, and partly to do with the egotism of the people involved, was that it was captured and identified with this group of people rather than the potentially kind of emergent, bottom-up, decentralized phenomenon that it could have been and that some other people were trying to kind of create like um, conversational clubs or spaces where people felt able to express themselves. And I, I feel like that was one of the big missed opportunities back in 2018 and onwards was that it was captured by these like massive debates on the stage and these sort of like WWF style smackdowns right. between different public figures rather than what is the what is the cultural need that this is fulfilling and where are these yeah how do we create environments where people feel if so many people feel shut down and unable to express themselves how do we create environments where they do in a way that means that it won't kind of go septic, go underground, yeah. or become the most toxic version of those arguments. Yeah, the whole come debate me uh, invocation is very limiting, I think. I mean, I talked about this with Sam Harris when he was on the podcast. 
I don't like to debate people. And sometimes I think that's because I'm just being like a coward. But I really don't think it's a productive way of having a, a conversation because by definition, you're trying to win and get the other person to lose. And that's actually antithetical to the mission, right? Um, I, I mean, the UK has its own history of debate societies and that's like, you know, very much part of the, part of your, part of your tradition. Our debate here in the US is about uh, ratings. You know, it's about yelling at each other, you know, in very, very short television segments. Uh, so I think you're right. I think it's impossible to, uh, I think it's impossible to get the sort of nuance that was the, the thing that was so exciting about this emergent kind of conversational sphere. It was, it was kind of doomed to fail uh, it, it, with this kind of media structure. Um, but I, you know, I, I do want to talk with you about, um, uh, a, a podcast that I think your listeners and mine will be familiar with, which is decoding the gurus. So this is, this is as meta as it gets. Okay. So now we have people coming on, you know, we have the, the YouTube pundit class talking about, uh, what's wrong with legacy media. And now we have, um, uh, another set of podcasters commenting on the, on the new podcasters. So. Um, Chris Kavanaugh and Matthew Brown are, um, the hosts of Decoding the Gurus. I think it's a really fun podcast. They, they, they critique, uh, everyone from Jordan Peterson to, um, the Weinsteins. That would be Eric Weinstein and his brother, Brett Weinstein and Brett's wife, Heather Hying. The, they're the evolutionary biologists. They've been on my show. People are familiar with them. Um, what do you think of Decoding the Gurus? And, um, are you, uh, are you a guru yourself? I, you can actually go to Reddit <laughs> where someone posted two days ago on the Decoding the Gurus subreddit, what, where do we stand on David Fuller? <laughs> wow, you know you've made it. Well, I don't want anyone to stand on me if I get a chance, but um, it was, it's interesting. It, it, how do I see, for the Decoding the Gurus, I, I like Chris. We've talked a few times. I think that what they do has a large amount of signal. I think it has some noise. They're quite controversial in the heterodox contrarian sphere. And I think uh, I, I kind of seen quite badly. I think some people would see them as kind of ankle biters yeah. or clout chasers. Personally, I think the, the sad truth about the whole IDW space is that these people have frame themselves as being sort of fearless truth tellers and willing to have the difficult conversations that no one else is. And yet, almost universally, they're, they are terrible at taking feedback or at, at even, conver even having conversations with people who disagree. Yeah. They're, they're appalling. They're remarkably thin-skinned. I have noticed that the, there's nobody yes. more thin-skinned than an edgelord. It's actually uncanny. Yeah. And, and that's really that's not good and chris makes the point that it's worse if you frame yourself in the in the way that you are open to that and yet and yet you're not because if you were just a partisan if you were kind of in the dirtbag left or the um kind of alt-right or whatever and you were just a partisan no one watching has any other impression other than they're a partisan whereas if you frame yourself as kind of the good faith person who's willing to have the conversations other people aren't, and yet that's not what you're doing, then I think that's a real problem. And so I think there, that criticism is really important. I think Chris and Matt, as I say, I think they, they're good faith. I think they sometimes walk the line between, between sarcasm and snark. And I've, I've made this point to Chris in a piece that I'm probably releasing fairly soon. And I really wonder how that's going to go down because it does feel like a kind of reaching across the boundaries in a way that I think is absolutely necessary. I see the, the way I look at the ecosystem, the information ecosystem, is that the, the intellectual dark web named this sort of emergent phenomenon and a certain number of people who were a counterpoint to the mainstream narrative. And then the decoding the gurus is the sort of the tip of a group of people who've also found themselves online, often academics, who are critical of the members of the IDW for mostly valid reasons, 
and the decoding the gurus, some of them are more or less good faith or bad faith in the way that they criticize some of these quite prominent people. But I think Chris and Matt are mostly good faith. And I also think they're open to conversation, they're open to criticism, and they're willing to, to have the conversation. And my, my big question with, with Chris and the Decode and the Gurus is whether they can avoid some of the issues that have plagued the IDW. Like they're, can they avoid the same kind of audience capture dynamics where they're just encouraged then to sort of dunk more and more and more and I know I'm going to put out a piece with Chris and about decoding the gurus fairly soon. And I, I know it's going to upset some people that I already have friendships with in the IDW space. And, and that, that's been a big, a big thing about my experience of the trajectory of the last few years is that I've upset a lot of people with my interview with Dave Rubin, for example, where he basically blocked me on, blocked me afterwards, refused to cut to uh, continue the conversation. James Lindsay, the same thing happened to, and there's been various others. Obviously, kind of, I had the, um, I was critical of Brett and Heather as well with their, what I see as very irresponsible messaging around COVID, and I and I called them out. Well, I actually was in dialogue with Brett for a lot behind the scenes. But this is one of the big factors that I think is nobody knows really how to deal with. People are trying to wrestle with it in, in real time, but no one really knows how to deal with what do you do when your friendships um, coincide with your kind of, your attempt to get at the truth right. cross, cross with like the incentive structures and your friendships and like, you can hear Sam Harris very much kind of wrestling with that in real time with with his when he he also did something similar where he was very critical of Brett and Heather. And I I was in contact with Brett a lot behind the scenes, asking him to come on and have a dialogue around some of the stuff he was doing, asking him to host a me medical figures who were getting in touch with me and saying, I'm really concerned about the messages that Brett's putting out. He used to be a fan. I want to go on his podcast and have that conversation. He refused and still has not posted anyone who disagrees. And I, I, so I, I did a series of pieces because I was really worried about this kind of increasing contrarianism and conspiratorialism that was kind of coming into the heterodox space and definitely lost a lot of kind of the audience mm. off the back of that, got a lot of criticisms. And I still don't know if I did the right thing because i don't know if there is a right thing to do in that environment but but yeah i, I found it deeply difficult and uncomfortable at the time which was last summer and yeah there, there, there are these very sort of deep ethical moral issues that we don't know how to deal with when we have we fused with our like we used to be sort of protected by the institutions in a way, like the news organization would have a certain perspective, whereas now we're at, we're all our individual news organizations. We don't really know what the rules are when they overlap with friendship or whether that, when they overlap with, yeah, other, other warping. And it's your livelihood. I mean, if you don't, if yeah. you lose your audience, you're because you didn't tow a certain line, you're going to lose your livelihood. But I'm curious, David, why do you say you don't know if you did the right thing? Because if you, were authentic to your own set of insights, how could that be anything other than the right thing? Because I wonder whether there were other opportunities that were lost along the way. That I, I, I wonder whether it might have been possible to continue to sort of host dialogues across that divide without nailing my colors so firmly to even though i wasn't at the time feeling like i was nailing my colors to firmly to one side of the divide i was just saying these specific things don't make sense and we need a, a healthier process of um coming to truth together was what i was trying to say but in in retrospect it did look like i was taking sides in a, around this sort of very emotive issue um 
which in some ways I guess I was on that specific topic, but I think the greater opportunity that I feel was lost was creating some way of mediating and coming to truth in a more healthy way. You know, do you ever think about like, you know, the, the experience of somebody who's had a real cancellation event, like Brett and Heather, mm. um, you know, somebody who has been um, deeply, deeply wounded and damaged by, by something like that versus people like us who are really not canceled. We're sort of, we're observing the cancellations and we maybe have lost friends and people kind of rolling their eyes at us or whatever it is, but that's a very different kind of way of being in the world. And I, I do notice that a lot of, a lot of people who do feel very aggrieved and often for good reasons, they're, they're going to tend to just dig in a lot more and there's going to be a kind of conspiratorial uh, maybe sensibility that like you and I don't have. And I don't really, this isn't really a question, but it's, it's something that I think about. It's almost just like, it's kind of like, are we appropriating, you know, are we speaking for them? Uh, we, we have a sort of uh, privileged position in that we haven't been hurt as much by these things. So it's easy for us to say, well, why can't you just, why can, not, why can Brett and Heather not just sit there and be like, okay, you know what, maybe we're, maybe we're wrong. Maybe they're not out to get, just because we're paranoid, you know, it doesn't mean they're out to get us. I, but I don't know. Maybe we're we're not being uh, having enough empathy for for how it feels to be them. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that the the paranoia in many cases predates the event and contributes to the event as well. Because if you start reacting to things in that way, it becomes a self fulfilling prophecy. If you become convinced that everyone is out to get you, and therefore you can't possibly have the conversation with someone because they might be kind of ready to kind of expose you and they're out with a nefarious agenda, then that just further entrenches you into that bubble. And I also think that there is a factor where if that has, if that kind of being cancelled has actually worked out quite well for you in the past, in the long run, then you start kind of, it starts becoming an attractor in terms of Actually, it, it, it becomes, it becomes a, also a self-fulfilling prophecy as well. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, we're being very careful not to name names. And I don't know if that's, if, if you know, I'm being sort of a coward or if, if that's a, if that's a judi judicious uh, strategy. But, you know, I, have you noticed this thing where a lot of people sort of brag about being canceled? They want to be canceled. Uh, and they're not really canceled. It's like they they kind of have this idea of themselves as these as these sort of dark heroes, and they're no one's really paying that much yeah. attention to them. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a there is an attractor now, and has been for quite a while. Actually, Chris Williamson, who was recently on the Decode and the Gurus podcast, and is a friend of mine talks quite openly about that, talk quite openly in the conversation that we had where he was he was almost rejected from a TED talk because of an interview he'd done with Douglas Murray. And he talks about having that kind of inner dialogue with himself where he was like, oh, this this could work out really well for me. This could be, and where he wasn't sure at the time, kind of like, whether he should capitalize on it or not. And I think he went ahead in the end with the, with the talk, but there was a point where he felt like I could, I could make this work for me. This could be my kind of cause celebre that, and he went through that, that whole kind of inner thought process and decided that it would be a, a moral compromise that would come back to bite him in the end if he did. But he, he talks about, like he, he talks about having the conversation with quite a few people and he, he came to the conclusion that it would it would be something that would work for him. He probably would get onto some podcasts. He probably would find. And so I I wonder, in retrospect, when I look back at some of the high profile cancellations, I do wonder if some people sort of steered into that at some on some level. Mm. Can you think of any examples? I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. <laughs> Name any name. Yeah. 
Yeah. It might be worth not naming names, but... <laughs> Yeah. I mean, well, there's the people who steered into it, but are you are those people who were already sort of professional media people to begin with? Because there's that cohort, but then there are the just the regular kind of academics or just people who find themselves caught up in this, and then they become almost folk heroes and they sort of lean into that. Yeah, I mean, the other thing to to note is that you've got to be careful when you're talking about cancellations because you can only be cancelled really by your own in group. Exactly. And a lot of people who are kind of claiming to be cancelled, it's like, well, you being criticised by the New York Times doesn't matter because that's not your in-group, right. whereas someone else being criticised by the New York Times. And, and the other thing is that what does bravery look like in the alternative media environment? For me, it has to look like saying something that your own audience is going to disagree with. And we should be looking for those people who are willing to say things because you can start off by saying things that is kind of counter mainstream. And I would I would put myself in this category as well. Like I sometimes get comments on some of the videos that I put out on Rebel Wisdom saying, oh, call this Rebel Wisdom. This is this is conventional wisdom. You're a you're a media shill. <laughs> because I'm I'm not, I'm trying to put out a slightly more nuanced perspective than just contrarian heterodox takes all the time because I find them pretty boring. And and I kind of want to respond to that and say, well, actually, yes, putting something out that I know my own audience is going to disagree with, I do think that's kind of brave. And that is kind of what rebellion, I think, looks like in the alternative media environment is that you may start off being anti, anti or critical of the mainstream, but once you've built your ecosystem, that's a new... <laughs> you're no longer heterodox, you're no longer heterodox because that heterodox ecosystem has become a new a new um, conformity. Home, homodox? So you, yes, exactly. I don't know what the yeah, word would be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the homodox academy. And and so then you've got to, it's the same thing that I guess great artists of the past, like David Bowie, realized that you'd have to keep reinventing yourself because, because if you don't, then you're ended up, you end up with an audience who just want to hear the old tunes from your last album rather than what might be really alive for you right now. Um, but David Bowie had a record label that would stay with him and continue to pay him. That's a good point. Yeah, I'm using David Bowie as one example, but I think the kind of the, the, the broader point works, even though I wouldn't compare anyone I know today. No, that's Bowie. what I, but it's like, this is the thing. Now that we are so siloed, everybody is, is a free agent. Everybody's relying on direct subscribers. I mean, this is what happened to the New York Times. As soon as the New York Times became dependent on a subscription model, the digital subscribers, it wrapped itself around the flag of the resistance, of the hashtag resistance. And it became mm. what we, what we see in the New York Times today, which is highly, highly worthy of criticism. Not entirely. But I mean, the direct the, the direct to subscriber model um, is uh, it, it it rewards saying the same thing over and over again. Reinvention is going to uh, be self sabotaging proposition. Yeah, and just to dig a little bit further into that dynamic, it means that if you put out something that's going to get people to unsubscribe, that's the that's the kind of kryptonite stuff that you won't go anywhere near. Which for the New York Times has become anything that is that doesn't toe the line on gender pronouns, for example, or any other topic. So it's it's more that you're you're much more likely to lose people who you offend by putting out stuff that might challenge their pre-existing biases than you are to attract new people. Right. Like that. Right. Right. Well, so when you left legacy media, what, did people think that you had kind of, um, you know, gone rogue or something? Like, what was the, what, what were your yes. relationships like with your colleagues? <laughs> um, I actually asked a friend of mine to make some delicate inquiries to find out how I'm how I'm seen, because there was, yeah, there, there. I know. I mean, Channel Four News is pretty much. It wasn't as bad while I was there, but it became the wokest place on TV. And Channel 4 is kind of the wokest TV channel in the UK. Also very, very, very good news organization. But I know that 
they did think that I'd gone kind of crazy when I when I left. Um, more to do with the gender stuff, from what I understand, than necessarily oh. just the Jordan Peterson interview, because I I'd been putting out stuff, and we we also started leading men's retreats as well, kind of independently of the media side of Rebel Wisdom, but it was something that happened at about the same time, and I think they really didn't understand that at all. It's interesting. I wanted to ask you about that because one of the things I've been thinking about, um, believe it or not, are sort of heterodox women's retreats because this is a very male-dominated space. And anybody who knows me knows I'm the last person to want to like have separate categories for women's things. And I don't, you know, I, I think, I think we are anything but an oppressed group. Uh, I think, uh, we actually, um, are doing better than men in a lot of ways, but in this kind of ecosystem, um, there are very few women speaking out for a lot of reasons. And I think some of them are pretty obvious. The social penalties for speaking out, it's not that they're worse for women, but women tend to be, in general, more sensitive to those penalties. Um, so I've been thinking about ways to kind of bring women in, but I also kind of cringe a little bit because I don't want to be like the women's guru. So I'm curious why you thought it was important to have men's retreats. Um, because it was something that helped me an awful lot in the past, I did, I mean, I, I kind of became a bit of a workshop junkie for quite a long time doing various kind of therapeutic processes and transformational processes, starting with something called the Hoffman process and then moving on through various other workshops. And I did something called Mankind Project back in 2009 and then a lot of follow-up work. And that was really powerful for me, sort of leadership stuff and just understanding myself a lot more, a lot of what Jordan Peterson talks about, to be honest, like the integration of the shadow and becoming more self-aware. And, and then it was something that I felt comfortable teaching and was also lucky enough to be mentored by an amazing guy who's been doing this kind of work for about 40 years. So it kind of happened quite naturally and organically, but I also feel like there is a real need for it in the culture because there isn't a lot of um, work around kind of emotional literacy for men. And what I find in particular is that there's a lot of the guys who come to our retreats say, talk about this kind of catch 22 position that they're in that I think is very real in the culture where they're encouraged to, they've got two contradictory messages. One, to be more emotionally uh, vulnerable, to be more kind of, and on the other side, stop taking up so much space. Yeah, like we want to we want to hear what you really think, but shut up. You're talking too much. And this is this is a double bind. This is a, a crazy double bind that I think the culture at large is imposing on men that we saw with like the Gillette ad where the same people who earlier were saying we need we need men to be more vulnerable and talk about their feelings when lots of men objected to that ad they said look at these cry babies you need to man up and it's like this is yeah this is a we've got a very weird schizophrenic attitude i think to to what is wanted from men in society and so i do think that and i also do think that the gender conversation is right at the heart of a lot of these cultural dynamics and i think it's fueling a lot of the cultural dynamics and in some way, and in very hidden ways a lot of the time. Um, Mary Harrington, she thinks that a lot of the, the kind of, the, the woke overreach and the, the kind of canceling within organizations over sort of these kind of hot button topics are basically female jockeying for position using this as an excuse. She thinks that because we've got so many more women in the workforce and so much of the, the kind of women's rivalry is hidden, that a lot of these are now manifesting of kind of like the, the in-group and the out-group using these kind of um, accusations and sort of cancelling te techniques as a way of jockeying for position. Right. So it was ever thus. This is, this is like a Mean Girls uh, 4.0 or something. Yeah. 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 Do you have thoughts about the men's rights movement? I think men's rights 
are fascinating. I think that whole world has been really underexplored and is misunderstood. I think, unfortunately, the people, the, the sort of leaders in that sphere are kind of bad actors or just not really equipped to handle the, the dimensions of the discussions. But um, I find that stuff fascinating. Custody, just issue, you know, issues around parental custody, domestic violence, you know, the whole the, the Duluth model, which I don't know if you know what that is. In the, you know, in the U.S., that means that basically in most municipalities, if the police are called to any kind of domestic violence, um, you know, any kind of domestic violence call, the man is automatically going to be the one who is arrested or assumed to be at fault. You know, the idea that women can never be abusers. I mean, that I think there's so much um, unexplored terrain there. And I wonder if that's something that that you've done anything on or, or thought a lot about. Yeah, we did a series of of films about that quite early in Rebel Wisdom. I interviewed the woman who directed the Red Pill movie. That's um, a great Cassandra J. Cassie J. Yeah, Cassie J. She's yes. that movie is terrific. I think. Yes, I was. A, it's interesting because I was a little bit skeptical of the story that was told in the movie because the way the movie goes is that she was wanting to do, that she was persuaded by them that she wanted to do a kind of expose on the men's rights movement and then was persuaded. And I, as a documentary maker, I watched that and I thought, how much of that is actually true? Because it's such a convenient narrative. Yeah. And so I was, I was skeptical, but then I met um one of the people in it who i really have a huge amount of respect for warren farrell who who is known as the father of the men's movement but this in itself is really fascinating he's known as the father of the men's movement but he's actually a couples counselor and he began the men's movement because he was he was a male feminist who saw the consciousness raising circles in the 70s and then of of women and wanted to create something similar for men and then when he heard some of the stories coming out of those about men's kind of uh, the issues that were coming up around custody or around like some of their their troubles and then started trying to bring those into the women's movement, he was shut down and told, no, we're, we're not here for that. And also his breaking point was when he realized that children were not at the center, that they would support the whatever the mother wanted ahead of the the rights of the child or the the needs of the child and he said okay this is a breaking point I, and he and he left the national organization for women but anyway i met him and he told me that her story cassie j's story was completely true that she had gone through that kind of dark night of the soul of oh no am i going to be hated when i put this film out and he said yes you are it's it's inevitable and she went through it anyway and so i had a really interesting interview with her where i kind of challenged her on a few things and she was very happy to kind of defend herself. And so, yes, the the men's rights movement. I also did an interview with one of the leaders of the men's rights movement that I felt uncomfortable with and I didn't actually put out because um, it didn't quite fit. And also because, um, yeah, what's his name? Paul Elam. Oh, yeah. Famously, Paul, Paul Elam is one of the is one of the sort of most strident voices in the men's rights movement and is there is a lot of misogyny. There is a lot of misogyny among a lot of people within the men's rights movement and it's caused by them feeling deeply hurt at the hands of women. And so much of the fuel for the kind of extreme side of the feminist movement is caused by women who feel deeply hurt by their interactions with men. And the problem with the men's rights movement is because the the media is dominated by essentially a kind of feminist and slightly misandrist perspective there isn't there isn't space for the conversation around there isn't space for a healthy conversation around men's rights so it gets relegated to the online space where it goes underground and then i think becomes goes septic becomes extreme and you get men who have these experiences with women where instead of being able to say well yeah women are people too right and often women will act out emotionally often women will behave emotionally violently and that's something that there is such a thing as toxic femininity as as much as well if you're going to use those if you're going to use those frames and say toxic masculinity then 
obviously there's toxic femininity. Oh, I've, that's well. a, I've said it's it's sexist to uh, deny that there's such a thing yeah. as to, as toxic femininity. I mean, how how, yeah. how dare you leave us out? Yeah. Yeah, and so you get instead of a healthy conversation, which is yes, women are people as well, and these things happen. What you end up with is young men who have those experiences find their way to these forums and not then they're told not that women will sometimes do this, but women will always do this. All women are like this. There, there's a kind of very strong ideology of all women will betray you if they if they find a a man who's got more alpha qualities than you do. You're a sucker if you etc cetera, etc. Cetera. The men's rights men going their own way, and it's understandable. A lot of the fuel for those movements has some validity, but it goes toxic when it becomes a kind of all pervasive ideology and a, a separatist ideology, where rather than how do we work this out together with healthy women who've done their own work, who are who are able to to have yeah, it, relationships are difficult, and and this is the very thing that Jordan Peterson was getting at when he first emerged yeah. for a lot of people, right? I mean, this was what was compelling about him because he was kind of synthesizing all of this in a way that was fairly legible and pretty pretty even keeled. Um, And now he's kind of lost that thread. Well, I mean, before I let you go, David, I mean, you know, you and I have talked about this idea. I, I, I kind of want to call it the heterodox 2.0, you know, we had the, uh, the IDW crowd and um, you know, now there are, there are people like, like us sort of trying to do a slightly more nuanced take on some of these ideas. What do you think is the future of this space? I mean, we've, we've talked about that a lot, but, you know, really in, in concrete terms, do you have a, a vision for all of this going forward? I mean, it's a good question as to how much there is a this space anymore at all. Right. There is no there there. There is no space in this space. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Given, given the fragmentation that's happened and the kind of famous fallouts and a lot more subterranean fallouts between a lot of the kind of the, the the high profile members of the heterodox space. My hope is that, my hope is for, I think we have to look at process rather than content. I think, as you said before, you were pointing to like the the limitations of something like debate. And I think the most interesting conversations now are around what are the techniques, the practices, the technologies that we can use to facilitate good faith dialogue? How can we create spaces where people feel we're able to kind of establish trust, we're able to establish protocols of interaction? among people who are able to go there, because I also think that you can't go there without recognizing all the ways we go off track, whether that's kind of emotional hijack and developing emotional literacy, or whether it's um, incentive hijack by people performing for their in-group rather than trying to negotiate and kind of come to a come to a dialogue, which is the other factor to, to bear in mind is that it takes bravery often to be a kind of emissary from one tribe to another and have those difficult conversations where you know you're going to get blowback from your own people, your own side. Famously, that's that's the most dangerous place to be in any kind of peace negotiation. And you often will get far more criticism and danger from people on your own side who feel that you've betrayed them. So I feel like the I feel like the the camps are so well established. And another piece I'd highly recommend is my friend Peter Lindbergh's foundational piece called The Mimetic Tribes of Culture War 2.0, where he talked about it being a, a, a multipolar war where some of the hottest battles are on, theoretically, the, the, your own side nowadays. So I think we need to look at things like how do we mediate between the warring tribes? What are the kind of qualities that we need to develop in ourselves? What are the kind of environments that we need to create? That's where I think the conversation needs to go, not so much from a propositional level of what's the opinions to have and the focus on just the kind of 
the content, but I think on the process and the yeah the ways that we might be able to 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 come to a healthy healthier form of truth seeking together. Yeah, yeah, and I think so much of it is to what you're doing. You you are bringing in regular people. You're not just like facilitate facilitating dialogues between people who have platforms. You have enormous amounts of people coming to your you know signing up for your 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 workshops and your classes your, your courses you you kind of you're you're bringing the world in that sounds grandiose but i think that that's going to be an important component of a lot of this going forward you know so well david thank you so much for speaking with me as always it's always good to talk with you and um hopefully we can continue the conversation yeah real pleasure megan i think we've just scratched the surface so indeed let's do this again sometime absolutely